This is Coronavirus Frustration Podcast number two. I had a fantastic chat today with Tim Bridle about his record-breaking flight of the 31st of May 2017 when he flew over 173 kilometres in a turnpoint flight, um, which is the longest flight conducted within the borders of Scotland to this day. Tim and I discussed his flight over uh, the Durama track log that was put together at the time. Um, the first sort of 10 minutes or so of this uh, YouTube video have no moving images. But once we start discussing the flight, then uh, you will see his track log unfold as he's discussing it. I'll also put a link uh, in the uh, description, the YouTube description, to that Durama track log, which has the track logs of about 21 pilots from that day, I think, um, on it. It just shows this incredible charge of pilots heading uh, northeast across Scotland. And also to um, Tim's XC League entry from that day as well. So you can go and peruse it at your leisure. Tim, thank you very much for um, joining me and agreeing to talk about your record-breaking flight from the 31st of May 2017. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me, Warwick. It's, uh, it, it's nice to nice to look at the drama that we did, actually, after all those years and, and sort of relive it at these difficult times where we're not allowed to go flying, eh? Absolutely. Um, what an amazing bit of inspiration and something to look forward to trying to do as soon as we're released from our uh, domestic cages. Um, it's a pretty epic flight. So it was 173.12 kilometres on uh, on the league, six hours in the air, um, maximum height of 6,300 feet. Yeah. Um, and on a on a glider that you'd borrowed from a mate um, that morning. Yeah, uh, Bob's Trango XC3. Um... Yeah, it was. A, I think I'd, I'd just ordered my new Skywalk Poison and thought, right, well, I, I'd advertised my KN at that stupid price. Uh, I was coming up for two years old, and I thought, right, I'll sell the, the KN5. And the guy had sort of uh, said he was having it, and but he hadn't paid me the money, so I thought, right, I'll, I'll, I'll take the KN out for one last flight, testimonial flight, you know. But in the car, I, I get a text to say that he's paid the money. Can I post it? I'm thinking, oh no! It's too, you know, it's halfway to Bob's house, and I, I live about 20 miles from Bob, uh, Bob Gare in Stirling. So yeah. I, I ring Bob up and say, Bob, can I fly your Trango today? And he said, Yeah, you're lucky. Trios, uh, Trios doesn't want to fly it. So, so I, I had a glider. So it was great. I got to Bob's, packed the KN5 up in some plastic bags and boxes, went to the post office and posted it off. And uh, there you are. We, we were away. We were off to Aberfoyle um, with uh, with Bob and Trios. That's amazing. I mean, um, it's very honest of you. Um, I'm sure a lot of people would have just had one cheeky last fly on it. Um, but also, it's amazing that you had time to you know, pack it up, go to the post office, and you were probably rushing to try and get to launch, were you? Yeah, it was a little bit frantic. Um, but but uh, Aberfoyle was sort of almost top drivable. It's not quite top drivable, but there's a road that goes up over, and it's quite a short walk up. Uh, and it's not far from Bob's, um, you know, so we had that advantage. We we were late starting and therefore Balquidder was uh, was not possible for us. The rest of the posse were all at Balquidder. I think um, Bob Matthews had rung the farmer and checked checked on the lambing and that type of stuff. Um, and, and most folk were, were across at Balquidder. Aberfoyle was a crow fly. It's, it's, it's about 20k sort of southwest of there. Um and we're on the edge of the red, you know, on the on the rasp. It was a good rasp day, mm -hmm. five star. And I think we're on the edge of it. The, 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 the trouble with Aberfoyle is, is is it's on the edge. It's the start of the hills. Yeah. If it's going to rain, it rains there. It's, it's not necessarily going to work. But we've had a few good flights from there now. Amazing. Um, it seems to be it seems to be a good place. Before we get into it, Tim, let, let me just ask you a little bit about your sort of background and history. How, how long have you been paragliding for? Uh, I, I bought my first paraglider when I was 30, and uh, I was born in 67. 
so 20 years at the time of this flight i've been flying about 20 years i, I was just learning to fly um back in 1997 and where did you learn uh down down near uh, rochdale um sort of area manchester sort of area uh pennines really yeah okay uh, but having having said that, I did I did do a week of hang gliding in the nineteen eighties, huh. uh, and I sort of lost my way a little bit with uh, with work and relationships and houses and uh, commitments, and it was uh, some time again before I uh, I flew. And by this time, they'd invented paragliding. So when I rang the school up to say I want to I want to you know I want to do a hang gliding course, they said no, don't be stupid, Tim. Paragliding is much more accessible. Um, and, and they are not looked back. Uh, Great. Yeah. And if, and typically, how many hours will he fly in an average year? They are uh, stopped. Uh, I shouldn't. I shouldn't admit to this, but I stopped doing a logbook. In fact, I've never done a logbook. Okay, <laughs> but but um, uh, I'm not. I'm not not too good at the admin side of the of the sport. But I reckon probably fifty or sixty. I would say in a in a good year. You know, yeah. uh, I normally have a holiday and uh, put in twenty thirty hours abroad right. each year. Um, so fair, fairly yeah. sort of standard numbers, yeah, by yeah, standard, yeah. By Scottish standards. And what about comps? Have you flown flown comps? I, I I did I did do the comp thing once upon a time. So uh, when I was a bit younger, um, I, I I I had a year off when I travelled the world backpacking with a paraglider, and I was I was quite good in them days. Um, you know, my glider skills were pretty good. Um, so in the early, I think I, I did, I free flew, I was a wind dummy for the Australian Open and the Kiwi Open in Manila uh, back in 1998. Gave me a bit of a taste for competitions. I managed to get to goal one day. Um, Fantastic. Yeah. And then I did the British Championships for a few years and um, when it was serial class in them days. So uh, it was a bit, it was a bit more accessible and I didn't do too bad first year. It was, uh, you know, we've got got to goal a couple of times, and you know, got top twenty. Um, and uh, yeah, but soon sort of tired of it, to be honest. Uh, I Did, think I think the risk with the comps is you, you do learn a lot, but they can detract from your in, enjoyment. You know, you can land, and you could have had a cracking flight, and then you know, because there's twenty people ahead of you, you're really pissed off. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so the, the numbers, the, you become obsessed with numbers and uh, results. Yeah, you yeah. can. And I always used to say, look, don't let the competition get in the way of your enjoyment. Um, right. And, you know, I've done the odd comp since. And I fly the North-South Cup and we, we do it for fun, right? It's not to say we're not competitive, but it's not the be-all and end-all, you know. It's, uh, you, try, you try and sort of park the ego to a, to a certain extent and just enjoy the flying. So what is it that motivates you now? What 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 makes you want to go flying? I guess it's it's just the love of flying, really. Um, it's something that's uh, in in my blood. Luckily, um, I say luckily, you know. Uh, yeah, I, I just enjoy flying. Um, I do enjoy cross country flying, yeah. um, and we do have a view to that. So, like on the big cross country days, we we try and fly cross country. But I'm just happy. Uh, when it's glassed off in the evening, skimming the grass on the local hills as well, I enjoy that just as much as I just enjoy flying. You know, just being in the air. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. And do you do you spend much time thinking about um, records or or other sort of ambitions that you might have? Not probably not not really, to be honest. Not as much as I would like in some ways. Me and uh, I, I normally go fly with Bob, Bob Gare, and we've well, we've both got families and, and young young children and commitments, and it's difficult. So we're we're a bit rubbish at uh, planning you know, anything really, um, and we normally rely on other people to a certain extent. It's not to say we can't make the decisions and we don't make the decisions, but but quite often we'll ring someone and sort of find out what their thinking is. We'll, we'll tap into the available knowledge and, and thinking that's out there, you know. So we we might ring Matt. Jules, we yeah. might ring Trias, we might, you know, we'll speak to to, to Bob and, and Stephen and, and Martin and see where they're going, you know, and, yeah. and then we'll make a decision. And, and, and as you know, that's quite often a painful sort of process to try and make sure you're in the best spot because, you know, it's flip a coin some days, isn't it? Which is the best deal. It's, well, you don't really know. Uh, it can be quite frustrating. 
and also there's so many like quite often conflicting points of view and uh, people sort of promoting one launch maybe because they don't want to drive as far as uh, as as they might need to if they're going to go to the best launch and all the rest of it yeah it's quite funny i think it's quite funny the way the telegram kicks off at sort of six thirty seven o'clock in the morning on a good flying day and there's a sort of tug of love going on between various launch sites. It's definitely, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, it's that gaggle drag isn't there. And uh, sometimes it's just uh, going to the right place because it's easy. But, I, I, you know, I remember once we were on the wrong hill. It was one, it was one year when the North-South Cup came to Scotland. I, I wasn't flying in it that year. And uh, partly it was partly because they were going somewhere that we didn't want to go there, you know, with a couple of low, lower airtime folks. So we decided to go to a different hill. Okay. And they all ended up having epic flights. And we did, did top to bottom under a murky sort of overcast sky. You know, we were clearly in the wrong place. And was that the Tinto, Tinto flight when they, they flew down into England? No, I flew on that one. Oh, okay. It was the one before that where they came up to Carn Leith, um, oh, okay. which is a long walk in near Pit Lockery, yeah. uh, Blair Athol sort of uh, area. Yeah. Uh, nice hill, but you know, it's, it's 40 minutes before you get to the hill, and then another 40 minutes up it. It's a killer. Yeah. Um, but, and it's in the boonies. So from there, if you bomb out, they had quite a few folk walking for five hours, you know, <laughs> to the nearest road. Um, but, but it was a better sky. And, and that, that day, we, we, we didn't tap into the available knowledge. We'd, you know, I knew people that were on that hill, and I never rang them up. And I, and I could, you know, so, so now I'm always sort of, sort of thinking, like, before I set off, have I, have I availed myself of all the, the relevant information from people? Is there anyone I could ring to find out what it's like where they are or, or what, what their reasoning is? And, and then you make a decision and you have to go with it and you can only make the best of what you're given on any particular day. And if you're on the wrong hill, you're on, on the wrong hill. That's just the way it goes, you know. It happens. Yeah, there's um, not much you can do about it once you're on launch. No, on this day, it just turned out we were on the right hill, really. We had an extra 20K on everyone else. Um, once we got to them, they were just launching. Uh, they weren't, you know, it was working a bit earlier at Aberfoyle. And as I say, when we got to Balfour, we'd already done 20k. And um, do you, what do you look at in terms of weather forecasting? What's, what apps or websites do you generally go to? They are. I use the, um, the, the RASP and the Lazy RASP is, is pretty good just as a starter, you know, which has got the, I don't know, it was that... Um, Martin that created that one. Who created that one? I think it was, was uh, it Stu Yarrow. I've got a few names. Stuart, yeah. yeah. I'm getting muddled up with his dad. I think his dad's Martin, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so, so the one that Stu did, that's, that's a really good resource. So I look at that, um, you know, at the start of each week. And I'll sort of say, right, I'll tell, tell me, boss, that looks good Wednesday, I might not be in, you know. Oh, wow. <laughs> or, 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 you know, Friday's looking reasonable, I might even just book it. And if it's not viable, I'll do some gardening or something, you know. But, so, the, yeah, I look at RASP. The thing with RASP is, uh, and the colours, they're great as an indicator, but I always make sure I look at, um, cl- click on the SKU T to okay. see what the development is and the overdevelopment, um, you know, the, the big clouds um, and whether or not it's going to, you know, going to go OD in the highlands. Yeah. Um, and uh, the, the one that's been, uh, I use a bit more now, more recently, is uh, it's the Windy. Yeah. Um, that, that's that's brilliant with the different the different models for the winds eh, and the different altitudes and that's that's re- a really good resource to check that sort of the, the wind at altitude uh, you know cloud base yeah um, that's that's one we often look at you know not just the thermal strength and the cloud height but what the, what the what the wind speed's doing a bit higher up and if it's manageable um, you know if it's if it's too windy higher up then uh, then it's, it's you know it's, it's a non-starter really you can maybe fly locally or on the coast what sort of wind speed do you would you consider to be too too windy uh, at base well it depends where we're flying in the mountains i'm a bit cautious i'm actually quite quite conservative um, as you can see from from my track log on the on the 31st of may there i was never really far away from a road <laughs> Because I don't like walking, and uh, I don't really go to the mountains if it's howling. But I might go down to Tinto, say, even you know, even if the, I know I'm going to be clocking 60k an hour downwind yeah. at base, yeah. then that's not a problem. And you know, uh, when when we go to to sort of Spain and things, sometimes at altitude we might be clocking 85, 90k an hour downwind, and uh-huh. that's not necessarily a problem. Yeah, you know, you, you know, it's just. Uh, 
it's a function of how strong the thermals are and uh, you, you know yeah okay there might be the odd shear layer um that, that can be a bit nasty uh, in Cape de Hita, say in Spain but so in Scotland you know much more than 20k an hour altitude and I'm thinking why that's a bit, a bit fresh for, for me in the mountains I, I would say yeah that sounds reasonable so um that morning you'd you'd uh been to the post office and uh you'd also been and done some some shopping I, as i recall yeah i was another fuck up i managed to leave all my flying gear not all my flying gear i've still got my crash helmet and my gloves and i think i probably had my electric gloves i can't remember if i, if I owned electric gloves in them days it's i probably did but i my flying jacket uh and normally i have uh two or two or three sort of down jackets or two down jackets and the prima loft sort of uh in a layer, I'd left all that at home. So basically, I had what I was dressed in. Um, <laughs> now, Aberfoyle's Aberfoyle, luckily, is one of those sort of sort of trip out on a Sunday type towns. And it's got it's got you know ice cream parlors, fish and chip shops, and outdoor clothing places. So I managed to pop in and get a couple of cheap fleeces. I didn't want to spend too much, but ended up costing me probably thirty or forty quid for a couple of uh, skinny fleeces type uh, tops. And, uh, well, it was worth yeah. it. It was definitely worth it. It had been gutted to be put on the ground by being cold. Yeah, well, uh, they are. Al- Al- Alistair uh, is a gardener, and we met him at the bottom and gave him a lift up the hill, and he had his van, and he had some gardening clothes, and he did offer me a, a jacket, which was a bit big for me and a bit sort of uh, mud-encrusted, so I decided to, to leave that and just, <laughs> just go with what I had. But, yeah, it was a bit chilly at base. At 6,300 6, feet, it got a little bit cold. I bet it did. So how were you feeling on launch? You had you had a bit of a rushed morning. You were on a, a wing that you, were you you wasn't yours and you hadn't flown before. Um, yeah, were you, were you stressed? Yeah, oh, oh no, I was. We were up for it, and uh, but it was working. We didn't have time to mess around, and uh, I didn't bother to declare a goal. Uh, there had been some talk. Um, Trias Trias is uh, you know he, he's always gone in for a record, and he knew exactly where he was heading. Uh, I, I didn't really know the places that they were talking about, um, so I, I didn't. I mean, I just tend to bimble along, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they they were off before me, which is unusual. Normally, I'm sort of uh, quick to get ready and quick to get off, and on this day, I was the last to take off, and that was partly because of the glider and its launch characteristics. I, I didn't think it was the easiest glider to launch the Triangle XC3 compared to the Skywalks, which launched very easily. But uh, yeah, second or third to uh, sort of attempt i was up and uh, straight into the uh, well straight into the same climb so i can't have been that far behind them um, literally took off and uh, i don't think i was ever lower than take off for the whole flight um from there on it was straight up um into the climb uh, trius had gone and uh, bob was topping out as i was climbing you know um, yeah and yeah. Did, so had you had the three of you discussed a, a goal at all even if you hadn't declared one no, I, 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 I think there was some sort of talk of Dufftown or Granton on Spay or somewhere like that, uh, that sort of general neck of the woods, you know. So we, we, we knew it was a big day and Trias was going for a record. And, and I, I was, uh, I, I, you know, uh, I have learned from, from folk like Trias and Brendan and Joel. So you, you do, it does, it, does aim, it does help to aim big, you know. Mm. Um, so I was just looking to... To, to, to go that way and see how far I could get. Um, but although I was ill-prepared in terms of equipment, um, I had sort of started this sort of regimen where I've, I, I give up coffee. This time of year, I give up coffee and caffeine and I give up beer so that when I wake up in the morning, I'm not dehydrated and uh, I don't need to drink a lot because I'm dehydrated and therefore I don't need to stop for a piss. I can fly for five or six hours. I don't have that sort of... Um, crash post caffeine crash an hour and a half into the flight uh, and sort of more on a constant level um so i i had sort of learned to prepare myself for a long flight in that respect you know in terms of the physicality um, of it is uh, concentrating and um not needing a piss because I, I don't wear a tube okay. um why why not out of interest Oh, I could say I can't find one big enough, but that would be light. <laughs> 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 no, I just uh, I just don't get on with them really. Uh, I'll wear one when I'm old and incontinent, which won't be too far away, cool. and I'm not going to wear one before. It's just a hobby. 
I find it. I, I find it so hard to use those things. I, I, it takes me a yeah. hell of a lot of concentration to be able to get the flow started. Uh, yes. <laughs> no, Bob. Uh, Bob uses a, a nappy sometimes. So he, he, when he was kids were younger, he discovered that actually a couple of uh, huggies. Uh, he could stuff them down the front of his pants, and they've got quite a good capacity. Huh. And, then, and he, he has uh, told the odd story about landing and and. He, he dropped the nappy somewhere in flight, <laughs> a, a fully laden nappy. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, but that, 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 that can work quite well, yeah. So looking at, I'm just looking at the track log as we're, as we're talking, and um, almost from the get-go, it doesn't look as if you three were, um, well, you and Bob flew together for the first couple of thermals, but then quite quickly the three of you seemed to part company yeah but bob's a bit like that we, we do we do our own thing me and bob but it's a nightmare to try and fly together with bob uh and trias is is just his glider's quite old but he's full bar everywhere is trias so it's right. the only way it flies i think it's so porous okay. <laughs> uh, it's uh it's, it's um it's an old Amiga 8, I think, from from 2012 or something like that. It's, oh, no, it's even older than that. I think it's coming up for 10 years old. Wow. He's still flying it now. But, but yeah, no, uh, they, they, were, they were off. I, I could see Trias, and Trias was going the right direction, and I thought I'd go, uh, you know, and go and help him. He was scratching on Ben Leddy. Bob had gone off to the left for some reason. Don't ask me why, because he, he told me a few weeks earlier, well, we normally go over the shoulder of Ben Leddy about there. And he'd ignored his own advice and, and, and headed a bit further north um, and, got, and got low. So uh, he scratched through to, to Balquida Valley, uh, a bit lower down. He, he, you know, he almost caught back up again. But, um, yeah, I was with Trias a little bit. Trias managed to get back up, um, you know, as as, as we sort of, as I dove over the back into Strathire, um, Trias came in and joined me. And we flew for the next, you know, five or ten k sort of together, uh, but he, he quite quickly got away from me. In all honesty, and by this point, presumably, you could see the gliders laid out on the on the slope, yes. slope ahead of you. Yeah, yeah, it was quite a picture. There was a couple in the air, um, but largely they were all laid out, and it was sort of quite nice uh, coming across there. It's happened before. So the, the two times I've come across from uh, um, Aberfoyle to Balquidder. It clearly works a bit earlier than like Aberfoyle, um, and, and both times they, they've been laid out on Balquid still all the time we've got there, you know. Oh, um, so I'm just looking at it now, it looks like Carl had got off early and had he was scooting away quite quickly. Yes, um, yes, I could see him in the distance. I think that was it. I, I think I didn't know who it was. Uh, I think he might have been on a red glider, a reddish colour glider. I can't remember what he was flying, um, if he was still on his Nova. Mentor, or whether he'd gone to his yeah. mentor or whether he'd gone to his uh, ozone by then I can't remember but yeah I, I could see him in the distance he, he got a good start yeah and then we've got Tom Straker in the air Tony Shepherd's there Adrian Paolo uh, yeah Matt, what a crowd yeah it was a good turnout Matt, um, was, Matt looks like Matt was uh, just getting into quick the away. them yeah yeah so, so it was. I I didn't really know where they were all where they all were until I watched your sort of replay, and I could sort of pause it and look round and see people taking off and, and and climbing out behind, as it were. But that was probably the first crux point of my flight, really. Other than uh, initially, initially, it was like, do I dive into Strathfire? I'm not terribly high, but it's not terribly windy. I know it'll work in Strathfire in the lee of Ben Leddy. Yeah, I'm going to go. And I went in, and it worked. And Trias joined me, but it was a little bit lower than I would have liked to have been. And that was fairly straightforward. We flew down towards Loch Ernead. Trias took a, a big hit, and then he got a big climb, and I couldn't connect with that climb, and uh, and he got away from me, and I got low there, and I had to be a bit patient. I, I flew to to, to Loch Ernead, see Martin Hogg fly in, and I just had to park up. I just just had to change gear, and that's one of those things I've learned over the years. It's, 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 it's quite you know, the temptation is just to tr to chase Trias. Trias is fast and he's got a climb and he's away and I've got to let him go. You, you know, I've got to fly my old flight. I'm sort of low now and I've got to park up and I've got to wait for the next cycle. You know, the thermals come in cycles and I, I think I've just missed the cycle that he's got away in yeah. and I've got to park up for a bit. And it, and it, seems, it seems to take an age for me to climb back to base um, at Loch Ernest, but it was working. Yeah. I got there eventually. Yeah. No, I'm just looking at that now. So, yeah, you scratch about a bit. Um, Carl's landed just below you. 
but then you get a, a, a bit of it looks like a bit of a weak thumb sort of drifting you back over the over yeah the it's all a bit weak that's it that, that's what um bob would call the, the temperature you know the, right. the yeah about the you, you might be parked up on origin and there might be a, a firm will come through and it's, it's a temptor yeah. It's not quite good enough to go, but the temptation is to go, yeah. you know. Uh, but, you know, actually, you should just take a little bit of height, be patient, wait for the ripper. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Don't go with the tempter. Um, you know, there's one there that's going to tempt you to go and you'll fall out the back and you end up landing because the cycle's not really established. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I was I sort of worked it. I was patient. I, bit, I searched around a lot. You know, that's a circle. It was definitely going to work, and it was definitely something going up. I just had to find it and get the timing right. And, uh, and when I did get up, by this time there were quite a lot of people ahead of me, or, or good, you know, a good gaggle of folk ahead. I could see across on Ben Moore, so Stephen and um, John Moore and uh, Paolo and the boys, and and you know, people already in, in Glen Lyons as I'm as I'm on transition towards the, the laws. I've now got to decide where I'm going. You know. My clouds are taking me a little bit more to east, um, and I couldn't see the logic of going into Glen Lyons particularly. I didn't really want to go that north, um, and, and you know, from there it's Randwick Station, Randwick Moor. You're in the boonies. I didn't really want to go that way, and and the, and the, the front face of the Moors Range was working well, and the clouds were great, and that's where the clouds that I were were under were sort of heading. And, uh, so I went that way really, and uh, right. from from there. Um, I was sort of on my own. I didn't really see many folk f- for a bit, although at the end of the Laws Range, I could see Adrian Howe down low on his uh, cure um, scratching. And I thought, well, I'm, you know, I've caught, I've caught up with Adrian. He's now lower than me and he's scratching. You know, I knew, he, I knew he'd get up. Yeah. But um, I, you know, uh, so didn't see Matt, didn't, didn't see Trias, but they were ahead by this stage. What, I mean, you, you s- what what informs your decisions? But you're basically flying alone at this point. Are you are you looking just at the clouds, um, or is it clouds and terrain, or is it not wanting to be too far from a road, or what? What are your sort of what makes yeah. you decide to go one way rather yeah. than another? <clears throat> yeah, I think I think it's a mix of mix of, uh, of all of those things. Really, I am I am a bit of a wuss in that at this time anyway. I didn't have a spot. My harness and kit. My harness is seven and a half, eight kilos. My kit all up is, you know, 17, 18 kilos. I don't like to walk too far if I can help it. So I do, I do have a, I do have an eye on uh, landing spots and I have a lot, uh, an eye on roads and, 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 and retrieves. Uh, um, me and Bob um, have this sort of unspoken rule that if we land somewhere stupid, we're on our own. You know, we've, we've both got families. And although we go out flying together, you know, if we land somewhere stupid, then the other the other one just pisses off on. Right. <laughs> Basically, right. that's just the way it works. So we 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 tend to sort of have uh, we don't tend to land in stupid places very often. Um, so we have a view to road. But that that said, the primary thing you know is is when you're in that climb, and I'm sure you've said this yourself, is is when you're in that climb. Once you get established, okay, when you're low, you have to work what you've got. And as you get a bit higher, you can explore it to maximise the speed of the climb to find a stronger lift. As you get, you know, above halfway, you're already looking, you know. You, 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 it's about, uh, I, think, I think it's Hugh Miller that talks about the bandwidth, isn't it? And it's, it's having that available bandwidth for the decision making. So when, you, when you're comfortable climbing and you can climb competently, you know, as you're climbing and you're established, you, you can relax a little bit now and you're looking you're looking at the clouds, you're looking at the terrain, you're looking for other gliders, you know. You're trying to sort of get a feel for the rhythm of the cycles a little bit as well because uh, obviously you don't want, you want to be going to clouds as they decay. Yeah. Um, and, and you're looking, you're, not, you're looking like your, your, your decision-making is, is started and you've still got a few minutes to, to make that decision as you climb um, and you can tweak it, you can you know, have a look at the drift, um, gauge the wind and... Uh, and, and they are from from there. I I tend to use my glide ratio and my ground speed um, on my on my GPS. I have a GPS, an old GPS, and in big numbers, it's got altitude, ground speed, and glide ratio. And I'm optimizing my glide and speed quite a lot. So I'll I'll just I'll just tend to go, you know, downwind as much as I can. 
you, you know, and um, trying to maximise that glide and speed and see where it takes me quite often. Uh, just, and I'll, just, I'll, I'll crosswind if I have to, um, but otherwise I'll, I'll go with it quite a lot. So just talk, talk a bit more about how you optimise, Tim, just for those you know, of us who, who are still learning the, the art of the glide. What are you doing specifically? Yeah, okay. Um, well, there's, there's a couple of things. It, it depends a little bit. Um, maybe not so much for Scottish flying, but one little tip that I was told once was always think about taking lift into wind. Um, so this this is perhaps more relevant to competitions and sort of uh, circuits. Um, but, uh, it, you know, it's if you've got the opportunity to, to take a bit of lift into wind, now when you turn to, 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 to go crosswind, you've got a bit more of a tailwind, if that makes any sense. So not only are you higher, but you've got more speed. Um, you know, you, you've gone a bit maybe, maybe you've gone a little bit sort of off track in a way, but you've got height and you've now got a better, better speed. So, so that's, that's sort of a, a tip that I, I would sort of say is quite useful. Um, if you're having to crosswind a bit, or push a bit more into wind, so that when you crosswind, you're coming down, you know, slightly downwind. Okay, I've sense. got you. Yeah, I'm following you now, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's a good one if you're crosswinding at all. Um, and the, the, the other thing in terms of glide is, I suppose it's, it's, it's uh, where to come out of that cloud or where to, where to leave the, the climb and, and, and strike for the edge of the cloud that you're in. To you know, and, and then to sort of transition through the sink as quickly as you can, mm-hmm. and then really, uh, you know, are, are there are there are there clouds that you can head towards? Is there a is there a street of clouds? Is there a, is there a band of lift? And and quite often, I'll let the glider find its own way to a certain extent because the glider knows where the lift is. You know, it it's sucking. You know, it'll mm-hmm. take you towards it. Um, mm-hmm. That sounds a bit weird, doesn't it? But but I let you know. I, I try and let the glider fly. I try and relax, feel the air, let the glider fly, have a look at the, the speed. You know, and it, if I if I turn a little bit and it speeds up, great. I'll stick with it. If I turn a little bit and it slows down, I'm not. I'm, you know, I'm weight shifting here. I'm not really doing a lot with the brakes, but maybe just a few degrees one way or the other will will change the speed in the glide and, and that's all I'm doing. I'm just fine tuning a little bit on the glides and transitions quite often. Mm-hmm. Unless I'm striking for a particular feature on the front of Ben Laws, say I know there's a trigger point there, that one's that one's uh, I can I can reach that one quite easily. It's sort of downwind. I'll go for that point you know, not yeah. right there. So if you're let's assume you're gliding but not towards known lift, what what's what are you doing with the bar? Are you half bar, full bar? Yeah, I'm a bit I mean, rubbish with that as well. I've got a fly a fast glider which would fly well on bar, but I don't tend to use the bar downwind an awful lot unless I'm in heavy sink. Okay. And then if I'm he- and it, and I'm a- I mean, if you're in heavy sink, it's quite often that there'll be some strong lifts associated with it. So you don't, you know, in a way, you don't really want to be on full bar unless unless you've come out the top of a you come out the top of a thermal and you know there's going to be a band of lift and you can get through that quickly. Then then I'll, then I'll squeeze the bar a little bit. But yeah. I'm a bit uh, I'm a bit rubbish at the bar. Okay. I, I I sort of learned to fly at a time when gliders weren't as stable. Yeah. And what they didn't have the they didn't have the, the the noses that they have now with the, the sharp noses and the ridgy foils and things. And when you put the bar on, they tended to collapse quite a lot. Okay. <laughs> so so um, I, I sort of never really got out of that sort of. Uh, so you got conditioned not to use it, basically. No, yeah. I mean, that's it. Yeah. And these modern gliders fly tremendously well on bar, and I, I have to sort of uh, maybe just retrain myself to push it a bit more often. I think. But now, generally speaking, in Scotland, uh, unless you're doing a triangle. If you're just doing a downwind bimble, I I don't use it unless I'm in sync. Or maybe there's someone in a climb I can see ahead and I want to get there quickly, I might, might put it on. But, okay. Um, so I, I don't know if you can see the, the track on the screen. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. That looks like you've just got towards the end of the – is that the end of the Laws range? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, I think that, that's that's it. And it's drifting quite a bit, isn't it, on that one? So there's a bit of wind there. Yeah. Uh, Let's have a look. Um, yeah, I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming off, uh, along the Laws Range there, still, am I? Yeah, it's quite early on, isn't it? That's right. So there's some spurs that go up um, to the mountains there, and then it sort of tails off at the end. 
towards um, Law's Village, I think, uh, where where sort of the end of Glen Lyons comes out as well. There's a little village there, and it sort of flattens off. Um, and there's Bob coming in. Yeah, I saw Bob on the day. So I've just taken a nice climb there, and I can see Bob coming in. I don't really know it's Bob because he's uh, – but I know his style. He flies sort of. He's a good scratcher, is Bob. So I've got. I'm in the hole there a little bit. It's sort of not really Lee, but the terrain's dropping away. There's yeah. still a spur there, um, and I've sort of dove in a little bit. I, I, you know, I would have liked to have been higher than that. But I know if I if I follow that tail out, there's a good chance I'll get something because it's um, coming up both sides, and and I did, you know. So I've got a nice little climb there. Um, you can see Matt and Trias there are, are ahead of me, effectively. They're a little bit further north, yeah. having come out of um, the top of Glen Lion. Yeah. But I'm climbing. I'm climbing quick, so uh, that's good. That's a nice climb. I did struggle a little bit on that glider because um, it was a little bit small for me, or I was at the top end. Right. I won't say I was over the top end, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I probably was. Looks um, like you and Adrian just about, oh, well, not quite, but you're quite close to each other there. Yeah, Adrian got a climb out. I saw him. Uh, we were at similar height, I guess. He was in the Lions, a bit lower perhaps, scratching. And I thought, oh, that's, uh, I don't, I'd rather be me than him because he was in close. But I know, I know, uh, I knew he'd get out. And I think he got a climb just uh, just after me and uh, is climbing well again there as, as well, which is nice. And you, you did quite a lot of turns in what looked like sort of zeros there. You, you sort of in a bit of survival mode there. Yeah, probably. Um, probably I'm sort of, um, part, part of me is, is, um, I'm, I'm shouting, come on, Bob, because <laughs> uh-huh. I can see Bob there, but yeah, um, there was a climb there. So, so they are, there's, you can sort of feel it. So quite often there's, there's a bit of, a uh, bit of instability. You can feel it. Yeah. So, you know, there's, you know, there's something going up and you've got to find it. Yeah. So that turning in zeros there is is that it will be the splinters on the edge of the thermal. It will be a bit, you know, I know there's something there. I've yeah. just got to find it. So, I, I, you know, same on, on the Loch Ernet there. I parked up. I needed to search out and find. And I'm probably in that mode there when I'm low is uh, I'm probably turning the sink a little bit. But I've yet to, to call anything, you know. And well, I guess you're also just contemplating the fact you're about to cross the southwest corner of the Cairngorms at this point. So you're, uh, you've got boonies ahead of you. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I sort of uh, hadn't really planned a route. And then I got to this point, got a good climb, and, and I could see Shehalian. Um And I'd been there with Shemek and uh, Zeb and Adrian and the boys once. We and like uh, we walked up in the winter and just had a little stroll around in, in, in the very early spring, I think it was. So I, I knew Shehalian and I knew the car park. And, and I thought, right, I'll, well, that's, I'll, I'll head that way. Worst case scenario, I can land at the car park. Uh, anyway, that night, rip her off the car park and climb down at Shahalian. Um, and you know, I, you know, I was moaning to Bob about his glider not climbing very well, and he sort of said, "Well, I saw you catch a ripper there." So he he, he was obviously a thermal behind at this point, but he saw me catch a, a really good one there and climb out at Shahalian. And from there on, never really got low. Never really got low again. Yeah. To, mm. to to be honest, it was pretty low stress because of the route I took. I wasn't using a lot of uh, emotional energy. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I was never far from a road. Right. I was never really sort of thinking, shit, if I don't get out of here, I'm bollocks. Do you know? Yeah. I was never really investing, uh, investing too much energy. So, so although that day I flew quite – and maybe that's why I was able to fly for six hours. Um, up to this point, I'm probably, what, a couple hours in? And it's been, apart from getting stuck on Loch Erned, um for a little bit, um, I've not really had to, to, to stress too much. Okay, end of Ben Laws, a little bit of a crux point. If I hadn't got something there, I might have been down. But I wasn't, you know, I wasn't worried too much. And from there on, got that climb at Shahali and I was away. I was, you know, up to, up to that point, I'd been quite low for the whole flight. And now, I think for the first time I was at base, with 5,000, 6,000 feet heading north, you know. So from there on, I never got low again. No. And was it an exceptional day? I mean, it looked, I mean, judging by the fact so many people were out and getting PBs, it was an exceptional day, but um, I wasn't there. I was at work that day, so I don't know. (laughs) I remember you saying, I think you were a bit pig sick, weren't you? I was actually Um, gutted. (laughs) Yeah, it was one of those days that was, uh, they sort of say, uh, once, once, 
three year, maybe even one set to five years. Having said that, there was one last year, um, which was a good day. Um, um, Emat and Jules were, I think, I think we were all down in the lakes flying the North South Cup. Um, certainly, me and Tony were down there. Uh, I'm not sure about Matt and Jules, and I've said that. But yeah, we, we were down in Lake District and uh, we missed it. And Trias almost took the record. Um, oh. And I think Bob uh, Bob Matthews did 130k um, from from Aberfoyle. So I think I think the the smart money now on that on on that good day on a southwesterly is Aberfoyle. Um, it's probably going to be all right, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's probably going to, you're probably going to get away, and it gives you that extra twenty k. So I think it's just a question of time. I think Trias has, has been close a couple of times. His route is a bit more, a bit more. Uh, it's got more potential, yeah. but it's also got more potential to hit Sea Breeze, um, which right. is done twice now. So you, you know that Sea Breeze is going to come in once you get to North at Cairngorm. There, yeah. Trias stays in the mountains a little bit longer. I think heading more sort of. With more east in it, he wants to, you know, like whereas that, that day I was heading more sort of more north northeast. Trias wants to stay inland a little bit, and he yeah. and he says, uh, you know, he, he says he'll break it when when the day's right and there's a bit more wind, and, and I think he probably will. Yeah. There's, there's more to be had on that on that angle from 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 there. I think. So looking at this just now, he's just flown over the um, Cairngorm ski area. That's Loch Morlich. We've got Mila Buckle there. So yeah, he's, yeah. He's, yeah. He's as you say, he's, he's, more north. He stayed in the hills. Country. Yeah. And was that a conscious? Whereas, I mean, was that a sort of? Um, I mean, again, how conscious a decision was it of yours to to not do that? I mean, I mean, in a sense, that seems like the obvious way. You've just got more land mass ahead of you in the in the direction that Trias is going. Yeah. No, I, I don't. I I think a I wanted to to be over. Uh, you know, over the pass, as it were. So I didn't go through Jamokja. I think Paolo and a couple of the lads, they 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 came more Darwinny or more towards Darwinny. I sort of I wasn't I cut more of a corner than than them boys. Although they'd probably taken a bit more of a tiger line across Rannoch, Rannoch Moor a little bit yeah. um, to get to Darwinny. They came in through the, the Jamokja Pass a little bit more. Whereas I I, I had gone over a bit of the higher ground. Um, through that uh, Glen Don or whatever it is, where you've got those two lockins, it's a nice, it's a nice physical feature, beautiful, beautiful spot. Yeah. But um, I didn't want to land in the boonies there, no. uh, as I say, and get home to wife um, and, and, and my daughter. Um, so I took cut across there, and by that time, Tony had joined me. Uh, he'd managed to scratch in, come into the side quite low. I wanted to stay as high as I could. And that's the other thing I'd say is is that it's always easier up higher. Yeah. So, you know, if you go anywhere low and you're unlucky because it's out of cycle, you'll land. Or if you go somewhere low and you know it's going to be windy because it's a compression area and it's, there's, there's, it wasn't terribly windy that day. There was, there was an element of wind. You know, I think at some stages I might have been clocking 55, 60 downwind. So what's that? There's maybe 20k an hour of wind. But in the compression, lower down, there's always that risk that the thermals will be broken. And I, I was maybe mincing a little bit just to stay high. And I think sometimes mincing just to stay high, um, just to take stock, maybe uh, take on a bit of fuel, have a little thing, uh, is less stressful than battling down low. Um, so I, I sort of crossed over there. And, and I was sort of happy that there was only uh, maybe 10, 15 minutes where I didn't have a glide to a road. You know, I think that's the only place in the flight where I was maybe maybe twenty minutes, half hour, where I I didn't have a glide to a road. Um, and that sounds a bit lazy, but it was sort of uh, one less thing to worry about in a way. Um, so as soon as I was over the over the big ones there and into that sort of uh, Newton Moor, King Gussie, uh, Aviemore Valley, I don't know what that valley's called, but it's into very, that it's area. Very, yeah. It was plain sailing because it was uh, clearly working in there. There was clouds, and I could bimble. I was bimbling deliberately then, to, in the hope that Tony would catch up. So Tony, um, Tony Shepherd was below me, behind me, and I was bimbling in weak. So I slowed down a little bit there so he could catch up and hopefully join me. And he just made a bit of a mistake. He left a uh, he left uh, a climb to to come under the climb that I was in, which was piss poor. And the only reason I was in it was because I was waiting for him. And I put him on the deck, I think, uh, uh, at Aviemore, which was a bit of a shame. And I almost at that point thought, oh, uh, an ice cream and a beer, that's not a bad flight. And I could land and have a chat with Tony. 
and, uh, and that, that, but then I thought I remembered that you know that um, I've flown with Steve Allen a few times, and Steve's a brilliant uh, flight coach, and, and he always says that the last hour of the day is the best hour. He says that there's no sink, the glides go forever, but you've got to earn the right to be there. You know, and, and, I, re- and I remembered that, and, and he's right. You know, maybe more so in Spain and things, but you you'll cover probably twice the distance in the last hour. As you did on any other hour in the flight, or because you're just on a glide and it's dashed off, and you know, the, the, I remember that. And, and at, that, at that point, you know, Aviemore, I gave myself a bit of a kick, pushed on a little bit, got probably the best climb of the day, topped out again at six thousand three hundred, and I thought, right, that's it. I'm, I'm, I'm high. I can see the sea breeze convergence. I'm above the sea breeze again. You know, if you're low, if you're low at this point into a headwind because the sea breeze is coming in and maybe the people that got low uh you know around about that stage were into a headwind uh, and i was above it still you know and it was only really when i got a little bit further on towards the coast uh, and the windmills that i was heading for i could see were actually turning the other way yeah. and i thought oh shit it's, it's hoofing in i mean they, they were it was really hoofing in below me but i still i'm still clocking 55 60 downwind yeah and i can see the windmill the windmills turning the other way yeah it looks like um, I mean, on the screen at the moment the climb that you've just taken there's quite a drift on it it looks like you've still got quite a strong well reasonable wind going in your direction anyway yeah yeah so i was lucky there in a way fortuitous that i got to have him more at a good time and i was still high got a climb you know across the car bridge uh, right, yeah, I got my bearings. I didn't know it was carbonage or whatever it's called. I could see a road that was going just the right direction, <laughs> just yeah. the way I wanted to go. Right. And I got another climb, and I, you know, and I drifted down that road, and I, there, was, there were still ground features and triggers. And I thought, well, I'll head for that little hillock there. And again, last climb of the day. And by this stage, I sort of knew it was the last climb of the day. Uh, and I'd not hit headwind. And then I'm gliding. And I'm dropping, I'm losing a bit of altitude, but I'm getting a good glide. I'm, I'm, I'm getting 55 downwind, 60 downwind. And then that starts to drop off. And, um, you know, I'm down to maybe 40 quite quickly. And I just I just decided to turn. And, and you know, had I, been, had I been conscious of a distance straight line from takeoff, I probably would have got a longer distance had I just pushed on, just put, pushed that bar out and just taken it straight line. Um, but I, you know, I was really just uh, interested in getting to civilization. Um, so I turned and dog legged and, and headed back towards what I didn't know was Nan, and landed not too far from Nan. Yeah. Um, going forward, which was which was lucky. I, did, I really didn't know. You know obviously, in that scenario where you're dropping down through, uh, you know, you know, there's a shear layer there. You know, you know, the winds below are coming 180 degrees opposite direction you know you're going to hit a bit of turbulence. And I was sort of a little bit of a squeaky bum moment, really, as I'm mm-hmm. dropping down through. But as I say, the, the, the triangle that I was flying, I was quite heavy. And it was, um, although it didn't climb very well, um, it, it had a good glide in a straight line. And uh, it was uh, it's quite a loaded design anyway. It's quite yeah. a whole high wing loading. And I didn't really feel too much turbulence dropping down into headwind. That's but good. I did feel it, and I saw the speed drop, and I just sort of dog leg straight away, if you like, to, to try and maximise that speed and, and glide ratio and cover a bit more ground to the main road. And the the, the triangle is a C, a, a ENC, I think, isn't it? It is an ENC, but, you know, I always say that aspect ratio um, is probably more important in some ways than the certification. And it's, you know, it's a 6.9 right. aspect ratio glide, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. It's, it's up there, you know. It's, yeah. it's, uh, they did remarkably well to get it into the C category, shall we say. Okay. Um, okay. You, you know, it's. Uh, but having said that, it was it was as good as gold. Um, uh, and, and, you know, although I was flying it quite heavy, uh, I you know I never had a flutter. Um, it was as good as gold. And obviously, to, to be able to get on to, on a glider, and, and I, I, I did one short flight at Glencoe, literally five minutes on it when Bob first got it, um, just just to give it a try. And I think I used Bob's harness even for that. And other than that, I've never flown it. But just to be able to get on it, climb straight away, and, and fly for six hours, it's. I have to say, it's a. It's a good. It was a good little glider. Absolutely. Uh, but also, yeah. it just goes to show that you know what we've heard over and over again that you doesn't. You don't need to have an Enzo to to fly big distance. Um, no, yeah. no. I think I think that day. I mean, uh, that day. Um, 
the glider had it, did have a, it, did have a, it does have a good glide and it has got a high aspect ratio. Um, it did help. I mean, what I would say is I could have done it on a B. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure I could have done that on a B. If, I, if I'd had my chili four in the car and taken that, uh, that would have been, you know, I would have probably had a similar result. It was uh, mm-hmm. not so much the glider as the the bandwidth. I would say mm-hmm. that, that's that's the thing. Six hours concentrating. Yeah, you need, you know, if you're flying an Enzo or a Zeno even or a Poison, you know, a, a more demanding glider, you've got less bandwidth. You know, to you know, you're more occupied. You're expending more energy. You're having to concentrate more. There's more. There's more. Uh, there's, there's more going on. You're not. You're not going to have the time to relax and enjoy the flight. You're not going to have the time to make the same decisions necessarily. Um, and they, they are. I think there's something in that. So to free up the bandwidth to be comfortable and confident on the glider that you're flying. Um, you know, I, I I I have a poison, and I normally have two gliders because do you know what. 50 60 hours a year isn't really enough to fly my poison yeah. properly yeah. and if i get on it now after being laid up um you know because of lockdown in the spring and it looks a bit spicy yeah. and i know i know it's going to be four ups five ups do i really want to get on it yeah well i've <laughs> I've, I've flown with you a couple of times when you've been on the poison and it's noticeable that you're very cautious and leaving yourself big margins when you're on it um which is obviously yeah. the right thing to do, but it's just you know, proves the point you're making. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And uh, you, you know, I, I love that glider, um, and uh, that was the reason I, I sold the the, the, the KN. Is, is in, in some respects, it's a, an easier glide, glider to fly. Although it's a D, it's sort of less demanding until it goes wrong. And yeah, I think you know, with uh, as Jules will probably testify when these uh, when these hot ships go wrong. They're pretty well unmanageable to mere mortals like like me and and, and you probably. No disrespect, like this. No. Uh, they're a bit bloody handful, you know. Um, I, I wouldn't stand a chance. I would not stand a chance. Um, so, Tim, you're on the you're on the ground um, at, on the Murray Coast. What what sort of time of day was it then? God, do you know what? I think it must have been about six o'clock. Wow. Uh, I, I can't remember. Uh, we I think we took off midday. And it was six hours later, so it must have been six or seven. I don't know. Uh, with the instruments, sometimes they, they're an hour out. I don't really, really set the, the clocks on the instruments, but I, I think we probably took off at twelve, and I think it was probably six o'clock. And, and I, there was, uh, yeah. I, I yeah. remember because I was sat at home, um, as I said, at work, and I remember the messages messages going out on Telegram, like, "Has anyone heard from Tim Bridal?" And um, I was looking on XC Find, and. Uh, it's like, yeah, he's still in the air. He's currently done, done 170 k. I was like, wow, pretty, pretty extraordinary. At what point did you realise that you'd broke, you'd broken the record? And also, before you get to that, do you know what the record was before and who held it? Yeah, well, I think I think that that's sort of in a way when you say it's a record, I always I'm always sort of sort of keen to point out it's not really the, the record. In that I know, you know Brendan did and some of the boys did. Uh, 240 from Tinto. So, like, it's only a record which is uh, of taking off and landing in Scotland record. Yeah. It's yeah. not the record for longest flight from Scotland. Do you sure. know what I mean? So, longest, so flight within, yesterday, within, yeah. longest flight within Scotland. Longest flight within Scotland, yeah. yeah. But like, uh, Brendan and the boys, uh, the North South Cup, that time from Tinto did 240. And, and that was my previous best flight. So, like, although I've been flying donkeys years, I left it a long, long time to do 100k in the UK. Uh, I don't think I, I think it's probably only within the last five years that I, I did a 100k flight. And I think the first time was uh, when I got my KN5 and we did that North South Cup day, and I, I ended up doing 150, 160. And I, 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 I only landed because I needed a piss, and maybe, maybe I should have had a tube because the rest, the rest of the, the gang did 240 that day. Um, but I was happy at, at 160 uh, that day. Um, so I didn't really know uh, what the, you know, the Scottish soil record was. I knew Brendan had it, and when I, what I normally do when I when I land, I ring Bob. I say, Bob, where are you? How did you get on? Are you all right? And we coordinate because obviously we, we 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 set off together. My car's at Bob's house, and uh, I tell him, and, 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 and he, you know, he sort of says, oh, I think that's I think that's the new record. I think it was 100, 100, 156 or something like that that Brendan. Did did uh, probably in, in a not dissimilar spot probably a bit further along the coast but having taken off from west of, uh, 
Nevis. Okay. Um, and I was there that day, actually. So I think it would have been about 90K to the A9 from where we took off. Um, and I, I bombed out in the middle of nowhere that day. But but, but that day, Brendan did 150-odd uh, K. So I only really just beat it in a straight line. It wasn't by an awful lot. Yeah. And it was, you know, more by luck than judgment, really. Uh, could I have, could I have maximised the distance? I probably could. I mean, I dog legged quite a bit at the end, and I could have, you know, I could have squeaked out a few more kilometres, no doubt, if I just was was conscious of it and uh, and then flew sort of down track, as it were, as opposed to downwind all the time. Sure, sure. And so, tell us about the retrieve. Um, you quite a long way to get home. Yeah, it wasn't a bad one though. To be honest, um, I, I couldn't. Uh, I was only a couple of miles outside the end. I couldn't hitch a lift, but I rang a taxi. I had good phone signal. So I rang a taxi. I had to piss around a little bit, went for a taxi, but a taxi came and picked me up. And she was really nice. And she said, well, you're lucky because the train line is out. The train line between Inverness and Aberdeen was out. So you can't head Aberdeen way. Uh, so I managed to get into Nairn and get the train to Inverness. And then at Inverness, I perhaps uh, had half an hour to kill, so I got some fish and chips. And then jumped on a train. And I think, I, I think, if I remember rightly, I think that train took me all the way to Stirling. Wow. Yeah, where my car was. And Bob met me with a car. Fantastic. So, uh, so I didn't really have to do any walking at all. <laughs> it was brilliant. Fantastic. Um, I may have had to change trains somewhere. I can't quite remember. Maybe I had to change in Dundee or something. But I, I got a feeling that that train went Perth, Stirling. Yeah, it would have, wouldn't it? it? I think it took me all the way to Stirling. So uh, it was brilliant. It's brilliant. And how do you feel after a big flight like that? Do you feel elated or you just washed out or i mean no like? that that day i mean quite often um it takes you a while to get your land legs back doesn't it? if you've been going around in bloody circles for five or six hours uh, and you've not eaten properly and you maybe not drunk enough uh i don't know about you but the first thing i do is i sort of land i sort of like um you know pose me glider up, have a look at my instruments have a piss have a drink back up uh, but yeah, no, I had a big smile. I have to say it was a cracking flight. And obviously my, my sort of PB in the UK, I've never found further than that in the UK. Um, I mean, the boys down south are all doing 200 Ks now, aren't they? But that's tremendously difficult in Scotland, I think. Yeah. No, I, I, I well, I've certainly never flown anything like um, that. I think my PB is about 72 K, something like that. But um, when I've been flying... Was that on the old Chile? That was on the Chile, yeah, yeah. Well, that's um, pretty bloody respectable on the on the chili. I have to say, Warwick. I think when now you've got the new the new one, which is a bit hotter, uh, I'd say that that the, the limits are, are, are partly in, in your own mind, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what I'm saying is is you you have to sort of dream big to a certain extent. And uh, I mean, I, I was lucky in that I I'd done various bits of that flight during other flights. So, like when you are completely somewhere new. An unknown. Obviously, that taxes the uh, taxes the bandwidth for a little bit, and the emotional investment is you don't really know where you are. It sort of adds to adds to the, the sort of mental exertion. But I'd done bits of that flight before, and, and it was just stitching them all together. Really, you know, I'd flown on the A9 at Tremont and Dalwini. I've done the Lords Range. I've done 50k. I've done the first 50k of that flight three weeks earlier. On the 50k. Um, so the first 50k was just what done this before you know. yeah that's got to um, help hasn't it i mean certainly i find flying in my local area that um i can go to places with a certain degree of confidence that it's going to trigger something and that that's just it just speeds you up apart from anything else it does it speeds you up and you're not exerting too much energy so therefore you've got a little bit more left in the in the tank as it were so when, when you get to the bits that are more challenging yeah um so yeah and, and i think that's that that sort of uh the bit that the bit that I've sort of I'm not I'm not I like to say I'm not too competitive because I know I probably am and I know <laughs> com, uh, and I know probably the competition doesn't always bring out the best in folk you know what I mean it doesn't bring out the best in me when I when I used to do the competitions I used to find myself shouting and swearing quite a lot yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know when people would cut me out of thermals and I so I'd start cutting them out of thermals and. And you know, it's, uh, it's that's not that's not bringing out the best in me. Um, and I had to sort of like back off from that and say, do you know what? It's about going flying with your mates. Yeah. And I'm I'm more than happy if someone flies further than me and they've had a good flight. As long as I've done my best and not made too many mistakes, I'm happy. So I just try and maximise. Um, 
you, you know, it's, it's about bringing the best, bringing the best you to the hill. Yeah. And you don't want to be rocking up with a hangover, needing a piss, yeah. you know, yeah. desperate for a coffee. Yeah. So that's the things I can affect. Okay, fitness, yeah, I can affect that a little bit as well. And I'll, I'll, I'm getting a bit old now. You know, this time of year, I start doing sit-ups and shit. You know, I, I'm quite an active flyer. I have quite a, a wide chest strap. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's one of those. You'll, you'll get chest strap purists to say it's got to be 38 centimeters. Don't, don't ever vary it. I just have mine fully open. Um, it, it's, it, it, you get more feeling, but you exert more energy. Um, yeah. You know, you can you weight shift it and you know, the feedback is, is amplified. Yeah. Um, but you need to be a little bit fitter for that, and maybe uh, so, so. Yeah, um, that's about what I do really in terms of the gels I discovered, um, the, the, the energy gels. So if I, if I were if I, if I was still on coffee or and caffeine, I would take a caffeine based energy gel that the cyclists use yeah. because after an hour and a half, your concentration will go. If you if you you all need a coffee, you know. Whereas if you're off the caffeine, completely off it. You're just more on a level, and five six hours, you, you've not got the peaks and troughs, you know. And the trough, the caffeine troughs, that's when you land. Hmm, that's when I used to land, anyway. Interesting. Well, that's that's uh, that's new to me, and I, I'm I'm a big coffee drinker, so I'll have to take that one on. So well, they are. You, you want to do those six hour flights? Then uh, see how you see. I get on either either caffeine gel or just try giving it up. You you have headaches and achy achy legs for a couple of days, but once you're off it. Yeah. Uh, your 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 you know your your concentration and I sort of picked that up a little bit from um, folk like Richard Carter you know yeah. and I remember t- someone telling me about a story where you know he, he'll treat a, a five or six hour drive somewhere as a training session right. can he drive five or six hours without stopping out without a piss <laughs> you, you know in the car because that's what you need to do when you're doing the long flights and he's the, he's a master of long flights you know yeah i think i probably picked it up from 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 richard i don't know the guy but uh, someone recounted the story you know or it was maybe an article i read or something like that you know Interesting. so what's next tim do you have any you know other ambitions in terms of your flying um career well I, I'm a bit old, you know. I look at some of the youngsters coming through, and uh, you know, I'm sort of. It's one of them, you know. Twenty years ago, I was quite good, and at that point, had I not gone back to work and became a paragliding bum, I, I, I think I, I probably uh, would have been reasonably, uh, reasonably good. At my age, I'm like 53 this year. Uh, I just, I just enjoy a bimble, to be honest. Um, I don't have a chance to plan a lot of flights. My dream flight in Scotland, or one of my dream flights in Scotland, would be from Annachmore, Fort William, to my house. Yeah. So I've, I've only I've only managed to fly back to my house a couple of times. Once was from Killin at Bergaman, which was a seventy k sort of flight where I landed in the next door neighbour's garden, which is which was really nice, and that got me thinking like I can do Annachmore to my house. It's about one hundred and twenty k, but it's a nice one hundred and twenty k. You know, there's some boonie to Annachmore. Yes. Um, so that would be a nice one, and and to get up north a bit more with you boys, to be honest, because it's beautiful up there. It and, is. Uh, I, I'd like to fly north of Ullapool. Um I, I, I have this. Uh, I mentioned to you to, to previously. Um, I have this uh, madcap idea where I've got track logs that go from Ullapool to Stirling, overlapping two or three flights or three or four flights. Flights where uh, the the track logs all overlap, so that takes me from Ullapool to Stirling, and then. The, I'm going to hope they have to open the corridor up again between Gargonac and Tinto. But then from Tinto, I've got a track log that goes 160k south. And, and I land at the foot of a flying site at Kirby Stephen. Um, so I can take off there and fly south again, you know. But if I, so I need to fly north from Ullapool and then maybe walk the last 30k to, to John O'Groats. <laughs> <laughs> and then carry on the, the other way, you know. And uh, I, I'm sure it must be almost possible to, to either fly or walk from Land's End to John O'Groats. Not all in a one but over over the next, you know, yeah. years. So. Link it together so, then. Yeah, so that, that that's sort of got half an eye half an eye on doing that, and uh, I'll just have to see if the opportunity presents itself. You know, but, what a fantastic thing to dream about, though. In the meantime, while we're locked, locked, especially when we're locked in with coronavirus. Yeah, so next time you boys go out, I don't know if you've got some nice routes planned up there. I've seen Adrian and uh, you know, and you guys do some lovely stuff. It looks beautiful, and I've only flown up there a couple of times, but well, but we are. Do you know what? When it's nice. There's nowhere nicer than Scotland, eh? No. And, you know, 
we, it breaks my heart that, you know, the, we have to do the North South Cup and the, they call it down south somewhere. Yeah. And the last two years, it's been five star flying days in Scotland and we've had to drive south. <laughs> and uh, it breaks your heart because down there it's pretty flat and pretty boring. Yeah, no, I think uh, we've got some of the best flying in the world, um, you know, on the right day. Oh, yeah, we don't, don't, we don't, don't. I wouldn't swap a good day in Scotland for, uh, you know, anywhere else, I don't think. Mm -hmm. Superb. Well, look, Tim, that's been, um, I think that's been an hour and nearly 20 minutes. So I, I won't take up any more of your time, but thank you very much. That's been really interesting. Um, and I hope to get out on the hill with you soon. Yeah, I see your new glider. Hopefully I'll get my new one by then, but I, I can't see it happening anytime soon. So I'm getting a new KN6, which uh, is a C. Um, it's probably the right decision for an old man like me is to, to come back down to a C because they fly so well now. Eh? And, uh, you know, and particularly when you fly these big gliders like you, I, I, I'll be struggling to keep up with you, I suspect, Warwick. But um, give us a shout. Next time's a nice day up north and we'll, we'll be up and I'll bring a tent. And, uh, well, you don't need um, to bring a tent. There's a room, a room in my house any time you like. Yeah, I won't be advertising that though. But yeah, fantastic. <laughs> All right, mate. Great. Hey, are well, Yes, you probably established. I can, I can talk for, to, I can talk for Scotland. So I'll let you get on. And uh, no, it's been pleasure talking to you, mate. You too. Oh, you can use that, use some of that for something. Well, for sure. Well, for sure. Thanks very much. All right, mate. Cheers, Tim. Bye. All right, bye. Well, right.